hello you. Why is Granada the best place to live in Spain? Well, I'll be joined shortly on the virtual settee by our friend and yours, Ruth Collins Cowburn, and I'll ask her why she thinks Granada City and province are so wonderful. Now, we've had to record this live show yesterday, but you can still go on the live chat over there. However, if you want to ask us any questions, do that in the comments below on YouTube under the video not on Facebook. And make sure you stick around till the end. There's always something lovely and important just for you there. In the meantime, gather round. It's time for our small but perfectly formed cosmic theme tune. Let's do the Granada dance. <laughs> Right, before I bring in Ruth, two very quick pieces of important information just for you. Number one, check out our really helpful website, u2spain.com, for more amazing information, blog articles and resources just for you. There's a free newsletter every month too. Woohoo! Number two, all of this helpful information and fun that you get from U2Spain is absolutely free. But if you appreciate the value of it, please help us to continue doing it by using the links in the video description below. You can get discounts on vital services that you need for your move to Spain and for your life here. And you can support us by giving a small amount each month via the Patreon link or just buymeacoffee.com or three or five. The companies that I recommend are tried and trusted and have become part of our wonderful YouTube Spain community and they contribute back to us every time you use the links. That's what keeps this channel buzzing. First thing to do, because it's so important to sort out your finances in advance, is use the link below to sign up to Smart Currency Exchange for all of your currency needs. But whatever stage you're at, you can benefit from being part of our extended family. And with their link, you'll be supporting YouTube Spain at no expense to you. It's a win, 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 win. So without further ado, let's meet our wonderful guest. It's Ruth Collins Cowburn. Hola, Ruth. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's lovely to have you back on the show. So before we talk about Granada, just tell the new members of our community a little bit about yourself first and about your move to Spain. So we moved to Spain in November 2021, post-Brexiteers, uh, after years of visiting Granada and Spain, and we decided to make the move permanent to clearly retirement. And here we are, still smiling, still living the dream. So then, Granada, you've got a fabulous list of eight things that make Granada the best. And I challenge all of our listeners to beat these things. So everybody put your comments below this video, not on Facebook, you chump, here on YouTube where everyone can see. Let's talk about why you think it's better where you live. Ooh, very contentious. But if we're going to argue about anything on here, I think it should be about how much more brilliant each part of Spain is, because that's just lovely for everybody. So come on then, Ruth, show us what Granada has. What's your first best thing? Well, I'm going to open with a little, I'm going to put some surprise facts in. So my first fun Ooh. fact is that Granada is Spanish for pomegranate. Mm -hmm. and pomegranate is the emblem of Granada and you see them wherever you go and once you start looking for them you can't stop they're everywhere they're on all the street furniture they're on the fountains uh, they're even on the back of my leg which uh, you might show people later on I was so impressed with Granada I have one tattooed on my leg it's really fascinating when you come here to sort of spot them in the most unusual places and they've been the emblem for hundreds and hundreds of years so whenever you see a pomegranate in the supermarket just think of Granada so number Beautiful. one on my list, in no particular order, just in order of things that I find oh, wonderful about where we live, is the geography. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a cliche, but you can ski in the morning and sunbathe in the afternoon, but it's absolutely true in Granada. So we're at the bottom of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, we have the highest, uh, third highest peak in Spain, we have in Sierra Nevada, and we have the most southerly ski resort in Europe. So from Granada, you, get a, you can get a bus, you can take the car straight up to the Sierra Nevada Ski Resort. It's a fantastic resort with, you, you think because you're in the middle of Spain, it's going to be something really small and, and, and not really kind of authentic. It's huge, huge. 
So we've got a bit of a problem at the moment, not so much snow, it's been rather warm, uh, but you can go up there, you can ski, you can snowboard, you can toboggan, there's even some automated sleds you can go on which are really, really fun. So you can do that in the morning, it's 25 minutes to the ski resort, but it's light ski in the morning, have your lunch, come back down the hill, another 40 minutes and you're at the coast. So mm-hmm. we've got the Costa Tropical or Costa Granada, and that's just never you know, eat shredded wheat to the east of Malaga province and the Costa del Sol. Just as sunny, uh, 300, more than 300 days a year of sun, but far less touristy, I would say. Mm-hmm. So we get the both, it's the best of all the world. So we've got everything that a Costa can offer you, but it's probably more Spanish than most of the Costas that you might be used to. So Costa Granada or Costa Tropical is if you come out of Granada and get onto the motorway and drive, if you get mm. wet feet, you've gone too far, you, you've missed the boardwalk. Mm. Uh, it literally goes down the hill for 40 minutes and... Down to Matril. First resort is Matril and then Salabreña, which is wonderful, which has a Casa Antico an old town and a new town. And then you have Eredara, Alamneca, and then I think Necha is on the border of Malaga province. So that's kind of our four big areas. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a really lovely mix of authentic Spanish, uh, but if you do feel the need for an English breakfast, you can get one mm. down there if you're feeling yeah. naughty. Alamneca as well. If you want to do scuba diving, Almanieca and uh, the place next door to Almanieca, can't remember the name, that's the one, and that's renowned for its beautiful clear waters, and they've got some schools there of scuba diving, so, yeah. It's, and it's so beautiful because you've got the cliffs as well. Uh, if you drive the N340, which is the coastal road around, it's just the views are absolutely stunning. So we're really lucky uh, that we've got We've got both things. And it, I mean, this week mm. I've, I was at the coast on Sunday. Uh, sorry, Monday I was at the coast and Tuesday I was at the ski resort. So that's my first mm. thing. I think mm-hmm. that we've got the most fabulous geography to be able to do everything. And I'll add to that as well. It's not only the hot and the cold, but you've got the it's almost the greenest part of Spain, certainly the south of Spain, because all of the floodwaters in the spring from the Sierra Nevadas go south down to the coast and that area is called the Alpujarras and that's where you get all kinds of tropical fruits growing that you can't get growing in any other part of Spain because of the the extra water and the heat and also the greenery and that's why they've if you look at the the maps from above you'll see lots and lots of white square areas which are all of the kind of greenhouses right the way along the coast because that's where all the fruits are grown that you can't grow anywhere else so you can get proper tropical African fruits there. Yes, we um, we do a good line in mangoes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Certain times of the year, the trees are absolutely laden with them. They're quite bizarre before they're ripe. I had to look them up. They're um, huge and purple. (laughs) They're driving past all these trees and there's just great big purple things hanging down. Really strange. But yes, Mm -hmm. the other good thing about living here with that just above the Albahara is our drinking water is absolutely Mm -hmm. magnificent. Mm. So we don't have to buy any bottled water, it's just beautiful. Yeah, both sides of the mountain. And also it's a place where there's a a very good example of the Moorish system of irrigation as well, where the water is flowing down the mountains and and there are trenches dug out. And everybody in different areas, you'll know if you move in there because you get a certain number of hours or minutes every week when you can open your channel and let water down to irrigate your own land. So it's all set up and that's been going for thousands of years. So the University of Granada have just done uh, a reinvigoration, let's say, of some of the irrigation channels as well that were left fallow. So because of the drought that we had this year, or the really hot weather, the hot summer, uh, they got together with, I think it was the INTMentos and farmers and just said, well, you know, why we literally, why reinvent the wheel? This land's been farmed for hundreds and thousands of years, so they've re- reinvigorated the old original irrigation, Moorish irrigation channels. Mm-hmm. And so to, to help, because if we have more and more uh, hot summers like we did this year, so they kind of said, well, no point trying to invent something new, it's already there. So uh, that's been really interesting to read about this year. Yeah, it is. And in the Alhambra, which I'm sure we'll talk about later when we get onto the city of Granada, 
there is uh, there are no pumps for the water no. in the Alhambra because it's of the way it's designed. Everything is slowly running downhill through all of the fountains. There's no pumps to get the water up through the fountains. It's all because of pressure, because it's all really carefully calculated and the slope of the thing. I mean, you need calculus to do that, to calculate slopes, to get the water flowing at the right rate. So they knew what they were doing with mathematics back in those days. So have we done enough about the geography? There's probably all kinds of geography. I'd, I'd say North Alpaharas as well. When you go up, there's a lovely hippie town of Orgeva there. And you can go up to uh, Pampaniera and Capillera. Those beautiful little Boobian, Trevelez, just Trevelez, yeah, that's the highest up one in the mountains, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful. Very windy roads, though. Can make you sick if you're not careful, if you're driving around those bends. That's what yeah, happened not, to my family. Not entirely for me. One of the things I probably should say about the geography is that with, with the mountains and the views, you do get some very wiggly roads. Uh, I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to love them. But mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going to do my favourite things about Granada, that's going to be not on the, it's probably on the other list of, of, of things, not necessarily my favourite thing. <laughs> OK, so let's move on to number two then. <laughs> You cannot come to Granada without talking about tapas. <laughs> Tapa for single, tapas for plural. Oh, this is this is probably one of my favourite things about living here. So it is the law in Granada province that you must be served some food with every drink that you buy. How fantastic is that? Who doesn't mm. want that? Even so the, water. Yes. Yeah, we we used to think it was just alcoholic drinks, but um, then we found out that uh, it's any drink. Uh, yeah. It's so tapas as you might buy it elsewhere, a small little piece of bread with something on it. Uh, the Grenadians take that to another level. So mm -hmm. the tapa you might get range from. There's a bar we go to. You get a really nice piece of bread like that with a chicken escalop on it, a breaded escalop. Wow. Hey, big. We have other bars you get full hamburger and chips. And that's just your first tapa. Wow, we that's get great. Things as diverse as fresh prawns. Uh, we've had steak and pimenton, the padron peppers. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got our little bar in the village. They do a very good line in ham and cheese toasties. And Ooh. each each tapa, you get like your entry level tapa. So you go to your bar and your first drink would be what we are we call our entry level so it'll probably be the most basic that they would provide then you have if you have a second drink you'll go to the next level up some bars start off at a really high level so we went this week we took some friends and our entry level was a lamb stew <gasps> so it was mm. slow braised lamb in a mint sauce and it was mm. just, just to die for and all the the lamb was still on the bone so you could really good gnaw of it uh, oh, mm. sorry to our vegetarian and vegan uh, viewers. Uh, but there are <laughs> other options. Other options are available. Mm. Then we had after that, uh, we had a chicken curry. That was another <gasps> dish. That was actually with chips, sort of potato mm. So it's just incredible. So not only <clears throat> does this make you into a bit of a pig, but uh, what's really good is you go out for a couple of drinks. The beer's about two fifty. The wine's two eighty. Get your plates of nibbles and you don't eat. If you don't mm. want to buy a meal, you don't have to. Now, the controversy is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And it's constantly talked about in the city and it divides people. Mm -hmm. So the two halves are, or mita mita, as we would say here, is 50% of us say, it's our heritage. It's what makes Granada Granada. It's fantastic. You never know what you're going to get. You don't, in general, you don't choose them. You're just presented with it, uh, which is really fun. Other people say that it's ruining the gastronomy of the region and that people won't eat. But I'd argue heavy that's not the case. If you want to go for a meal, you go for a meal. Okay, if you want, mm -hmm. if you want to go out for a nice meal, you're going to go out for a nice meal. If you just want a couple mm -hmm. of beers, it's a really fun way to have your afternoon tea or your pre-dinner snacks or whatever. I, I think the same argument used to be said about people not buying records because of cassettes, because people were recording from each other. But actually what happened, and it was researched, and the fact is that the more people borrowed music from other people and got it illegally and, and recorded it, make second recordings of it, the more records they would go out and buy by that artist because they were introduced to them. And, yeah. Yeah. 
that's the it, way it works with food as well exactly it's a great way of trying the local cuisine most bars that you go into the tapa you can then go on to buy that in the restaurant so nearly everything that they serve you will also be on the menu for you to mm -hmm. have you do need to be aware of things that you don't like or to say when you go in if you've got allergies or whatever but uh, and, mm -hmm. and kios for me is the big no-no so kios mm -hmm. c-a-double-o-s is tripe okay uh, i don't <clears throat> I, I can eat it at a push, but I'm always aware if I'm listening out in the bar, I think, oh, if I hear that as a tapa, I'm like, sin tapa. Uh, yeah. With the tapas, you have to say no, you don't want them, otherwise they will keep coming. Mm -hmm. So even if you go to a bar and you have your tapa, you have your drink, you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to have lunch or dinner, and you order your main meal, and then you order another drink, you will get another tapa as well. Mm -hmm. Is this the same outside Granada City? Is it across the province that it's the law? It's across the province. When you get down to the costas, when you get down to the coast, the tapas get less intricate. You might get a little bowl of olives mm -hmm. or a little plate of crisps or something. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? It's the, same, it's the same in Malaga province. It, it kind of gets more watered down, but you you still get... It tends to be the, the little bowl of olives... That's, yeah. that's about standard. We call, that, yeah. we call that a bad tapa in Granada. Mm. If I get yeah. served a bowl of olives, I won't go back there. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. I want the, uh, the interest in food. So it's, I think it's what makes Granada fantastic. It's just such fun to go out and have a drink and see what you're going to get given. So, <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the, the one that they've changed this year, quite last year rather, quite rightly so, is Russian salad. Russian salad mm. is a Spanish staple, which is mashed potato tuna sometimes peppers sometimes onions sometimes a little olive in there and they now in granada they now call it enfilada ukrania yeah very good absolutely <laughs> perfect so we don't call it russian salad anymore so perfect so that was number two on my list yes and appropriately we turn to f food again for number three so I thought we'd segue into gastronomy. So you mentioned the Albahara and the microclimate that we have there. So the Albahara is the next range of mountains that sits beneath the Sierra Nevada and creates some of the most fantastic food of the region. Mm -hmm. So your hamons, that you see your Spanish hams hanging up in the bar, they, they come from the Albahara. Your cheeses, fruits, your dried fruits, and it's just just exquisite I mean the hams alone you can go into a supermarket and you can pay anywhere from four kilo four euros a kilo I think the most expensive I've seen is 120 euros a kilo for ham mm -hmm. but it's good so, ham. It's, oh yeah I mean it's like nothing you've ever eaten I mean and you can you can buy these as well I say a kilo, who would want a kilo of ham on? You'd be eating it forever. So you mm. can go and buy really little bits just to taste it. So you can buy, mm. I don't know, maybe two, two or three euros worth to try it all. Um, and the shops, we have special ham on shops in Granada that sell just ham on. Or you might have a, one, a ham on air and a, a cheese shop as well that just sell local produce. And I think it's, it's very simple food here. We do have michelin star restaurants in the area but most food is very very simple so classic dish in granada and i i will fight anybody to tell me there's better is ham egg and chips mm. but it's elevated ham, ham egg and chips uh either patata fritas or patata pobre which is uh the potatoes cooked in oil so sliced mm. potatoes so have that on the bottom and then they put their ham on, and then they put fried eggs, and they'll serve it to you on a platter, and then they cut into it like this, so all the egg that drizzles over everything, and it's mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. So simple, mm -hmm. but the ingredients are so beautiful that you think you're eating some, as I say, Michelin star dish. So quite mm -hmm. often you go into restaurants here, and it will be your order chilettas, so and my favorite is lamb chops. And you'll go mm. in and you'll order a lamb chop. And that is what you will get, a plate of lamb chops. Because the food's so good and it's such good quality, there's no need to add extra bits to it. So I think that's what makes our gastronomy very, very interesting. It's simple, but it's exquisite. So mm -hmm. we're both, after our 14 months here, we're both now on diets. That's how good mm. it is. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> 
There we go. So moving on to number four. So number four is the language. <clears throat> now, this might not interest everybody, but it's one of the reasons I think Granada is fabulous. So in Granada, obviously they speak Spanish, Castellan, the national version of Spanish. But mm. Andalusia is known for its lazy Spanish, has quite strongly dialect. And Granada is known for even lazier Spanish than the Andalusian dialect. Mm. So we have curious little habits here that we will drop the last consonant of a word. So for example, dos mas, two more, becomes doma. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a shop or a bar and you say, you'd want two more, it'll be doma, not dos mas. Mm -hmm. Por favor becomes por fav. Mm -hmm. uh, buena dia, buenas dias. So if you were somewhere and spoke terribly correctly, like my neighbor three doors down, we call him senior proper because he speaks terribly correctly. I don't think mm -hmm. he's from Granada. He will always say, buenas dias. And the other <laughs> will say the variants of buen dia, buena dia. The best one I've ever heard here. And I'm like, that, now that is short and it is buen. <laughs> Can't get shorter than that, can you? Over here we get uh, buena or just dia. But the best one was buen. And I thought, now look. Bwe. I know it gets hot here. <laughs> I know we all get tired and conservation of energy is terribly important. But if you're cutting back on that many syllables, then I don't know what else. So it's been fascinating to learn Spanish here, but learn it in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen if we go to Barcelona to visit. I don't think anyone's going to understand us uh, because we're mm. learning to, to speak in, in this way. But it's you can go into one shop and you'll have a conversation <clears throat> using that you learn Spanish and think, oh, I'm doing really, really well. And then they'll go into another one and you'll not have a clue because they're so heavily accented. And you just think, I didn't get a word of that. Mm. But even even our neighbours who help us, they say, you know, it is, it is a very interesting element of the language to learn here because it is so different. So, uh, mm. so yes, yeah, so we're, we're learning probably the equivalent of Geordie or from my hometown, deepest, darkest, Somersetshire, Spanish mm -hmm. is probably what we're learning. But I think it's a really fun part of Granada. So when you come and visit, be prepared that the words sound very, very different. So that oh, brings yeah. us on to the people. Yes, number five, the people. Oh, wow, the people. Um, I have never, I've lived all over England. I've lived in several places in Europe and I have never lived anywhere where everyone is happy. And, you know, I used to think when we used to come on holiday here, well, you know, we're on holiday and of course everyone's upbeat and you're happy and yay. It's, it's, just, it's just every day. Everybody speaks to you. You'll be in the street, buon dia, buon, buon, buona, everybody, hola. You go into a shop, as soon as you go in, you say buona dia, hmm. even if they're serving someone else. And everyone will look up, buona dia, hola. As soon as you leave Alueo, say goodbye, everyone does the same. They're genuinely pleased to see you. They're genuinely pleased to be alive. Every day is a new day to eat more, drink more, discover more. There's not a mm. person you meet that looks downtrodden. It's, it's just a fantastic way to be. It lifts your soul. We went back to England for Christmas. Oh, and I was just, I had the lifeblood <laughs> sucked out of me by the time we'd been there for a fortnight. Mm. Grenadian people, they say, it's all about living. They want to, ex it's all about the experience, it's all about the sharing, it's all about being, not doing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they'll take three hours over lunch. That's fine, there's nothing spoiling. Um, mm -hmm. They just want to welcome you. They want you to be happy. They, they, everyone's all, when they find out that you, you've moved here, their first question is, do you love it? Do you really love it here? Is it, is it the best place you've ever been? And you're like, yeah, it's the best place. Oh, good, good. We're so glad. And they want they want you to settle in. They want you to experience the best of everything. Mm -hmm. They're not the most um, fast-paced people, as I say. So you've got to learn to slow down here. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn that it'll happen when it happens. Don't sweat. That's why they're so happy, isn't it? Because they're so yeah. laid back about it. And people criticize people are worried about this attitude of it's the manana attitude and and some i've heard some spaniards say stop calling us uh, you know manana's because it's making us 
you're accusing us of being lazy. But I don't think that's what manana is all about. It's about the happiness and the living being more important than the 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 day to day rat race. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not the other thing here as well in Granada, I think, is there doesn't it's a very, very vibrant city and I'll talk about Granada in a bit, but it's there doesn't seem any push for financial gain or to wear the latest fashions or to have the best car. It's about did you have the best tapa? Mm. Did you get the best cup of coffee? Did you sit in the sun today? It's about the experience. They've got a mm. saying here called La Prisa Mata, which literally translates as the hurry kills. And uh. it's like, don't don't hurry. It'll kill you. There's there's no reason to hurry. And it's mm. best it's best observed in waiters in Granada. So you'll sit on a patio at Terrata, you'll sit down, and you'll be terribly English and why is he not, well, I'm, I need to be served, I need a drink, I have got a drink. Can you see him? Can you catch his eye? Is he there? Is he looking? Is he? And what they do is they'll come out and they'll just take in the view and they're just stood there and they're looking around and thinking, yeah, I love my job. <laughs> oh, I'll go back in, I might serve you in a minute. <laughs> La Prisa Mata, it doesn't matter. If you want a drink, you'll sit there, I'll get to you. And after a few months, you really, you feel your shoulders drop. Mm. You feel everything drop and you think, yeah, there is no it doesn't matter, it's no hurry. It's it's just just be, stop doing. So the people here brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. That is lovely. So we move on to number six because we're going to talk about the city now. Love it. Granada itself. Granada, if you're gonna Granada. say it in the vernacular. So what do we want to know about Granada? Well, there's hundreds of years of history so let's go back to a little fun fact about that i love to talk about that makes this makes my skin come alive puts goosebumps on me did you know that catherine of aragon grew up here henry the eighth's first wife wow no so, i didn't well her mum and dad queen isabella and king ferdinand they were the original Catholic, raised Catholicos, the Catholic kings, and they were responsible for reclaiming uh, Spain for the Catholics, if you want to believe that it should have been reclaimed, or uh, taking over from the Moors, depending on your point of view. Mm -hmm. So they came down from Castilla y Leon, and they progressively worked all the way down through Spain, and they captured Granada, and they banished the Moors, they had an agreement with the Moors, first of all, that they could stay mm. in a certain part of the town. And then after a year, they went, oh, no, we've changed our minds and got rid of them all. Mm -hmm. So Catherine of Aragon was their daughter, and she grew up in the Alhambra Palace. So when mm. I visit the Alhambra Palace and I touch those palace walls, and I think Henry VIII's first wife was here. <sighs> this is where, really, in my view, the history of Britain, the Tudor history, began here because <coughs> Catherine of Aragon, the Spanish Infanta, was betrothed to Prince Arthur, Henry VIII's brother. Mm -hmm. and she married him because it's really important to have the Anglo Spanish connections. And then he died, as you know, very young. He died at 16. And then she was, after she was banished for a while, then, as we all know, she married Henry VIII. Now, Catherine of Aragon, because her mother and father were great warlords, in particular Queen Isabella, she, Catherine of Aragon, learned all this at her mother's name. And she actually was the driving force behind Henry VIII. She was the one that decided to put all the northern powerhouse in place in England, so all, the, all your northern lords, Lord Percy, uh, etc. She it was her that did all of that. And she mm -hmm. used to send Henry off on make-believe wars. And, oh, you must go and fight the French. There's nothing really wrong with them. She'd send him off and he'd be all. <laughs> Henry's amazing. She off you go, dear. And then while he was away and she was Queen Regent, she was the one that put everything in place. Mm. So there's a great connection between the Alhambra and, and Britain. It's, it's fascinating. Mm. So the Alhambra Palace itself is a World Heritage Site. has to be seen to be believed. You could go there every day of your life and watch the sunset. And you'd think you'd have to go again tomorrow and see it. It's stunningly beautiful. It just captures the heart of anybody who goes there. It's, it's 
the light changes every minute you look at it from sunrise to sunset. The colour of the bricks goes from a gorgeous grey through to an orange through to a pink. It's, mm. it's well worth a visit in itself. If you did nothing else in Granada and you went, and you went to the Alhambra, mm -hmm. then you, you would have fulfilled a life ambition, in my humble opinion. But that's and, I would, and I would actually recommend people read Tales of the Alhambra by Washington Irving because the Alhambra was kind of going into disrepair by yeah. the, was it 19th century when he went and he took a journey down through Spain and romanticised this idea of what the Alhambra Palace was and it's since then that it's become a tourist destination and it's because of that lots of money was spent on it and that's why it is it is possibly one of the best tourist places to visit in the whole of Spain I would say and yeah. it is gorgeous I mean I've been there twice with with Liz and it's just the the tales that you can hear they all started with with this book which I, which I bought when I was there and fabulous stories and he, he talks about all of the people as he's journeying through Spain as well and all of the people that he meets along the way and of course he's this rich traveler so they tell him all of the tales and all of these tales, a lot of it's legend and myth. So, but they became the the, the mythology of the Alhambra when uh, after he was there, because everybody wanted to come and see these 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 different places where he'd stayed, and some of the rooms were built up and and made new again for him while he was there. So it would never have happened yeah, again really, if it wasn't for him. It's a really good mix of some of it is still original, some of it, as you say, has been um, renovated. The really brilliant thing for us that we just found out <clears throat> a few months ago is as citizens of the city, we qualify for free entry. Oh, lovely. So we're going to do our first free entry next week. So every Monday you mm. can go into the city and claim your free tickets. And, uh, oh, lovely. So, uh, really well, I'll let you do all the tales. Go, go with a guide because there are some amazing guides there and they'll tell you all yeah. of the details that you that you can't see when you just wander around on your own but you know take the evening visit as well because when it's lit up on the inside go around the gardens yes. in the evening they do some concerts there as well in the summer which are meant to be mm. fantastic which we didn't get to last year but they're meant to be they just look stunning so that's yeah. the alhambra that's only i would mm. say that's that bit of granada we have mm -hmm. got the most fabulous architecture ranging from sacramonte which is where mm. the hitana the gypsy quarter is and still was, uh, was and still is, they still inhabit that area. Uh, that's all your cave houses. And you move through there, <coughs> past the Alhambra, and you go into kind of 18th century Granada, very grand porticos. Mm. It's a bit like walk, walking through uh, Paris, some parts of Georgian Bath, great big buildings, really, really fancy windows, beautiful, gorgeous greens, creams, pinks, just fantastic wide boulevards, a grand via colon, which every Spanish city's got one, but ours is the best, obviously, mm. because yeah. Queen, Queen Isabella, who sponsored Christopher Columbus, so every via colon is named after him, but of course ours is best. And then you go through there and you go through the Arab Quarter. So we've got very sort of Moorish buildings and there's parts yeah. where you think you're in Morocco and the smells and the sights and the sounds, you could, you could be in Marrakesh. So we've got lots of different quarters that you can go to. Then you've got the modern part of Granada, which is kind mm. of at the Granada Norte and West Granada, which is just like any cosmopolitan city, big high rises, modern shops. Uh, we've got the shopping center in commercial Nevada, uh, which is like a big you know, shopping mall at the edge of Granada. So we've got something for everybody, whatever floats your boat. There mm. is something for everybody here. It's just a constant look up and wonder uh, but you do need to be aware of the metal pomegranates that are in the street. All the streets are lined with these metal street furniture. So, because some of the streets are wider, some of them are quite narrow. So, you get cars mm. coming down so you can stay in the pedestrianised bits. Um, so, you're busy looking up and going, oh, it's amazing. And you'll dunk, fall over one of them. So, mm. just be aware of them if you come. Like think, very short um, bollards, aren't they? Very short bollards. Yeah, <laughs> they're just knee height. That's mm. what they are. Just designed to catch you on the knee. I think mm. the um, one of the amazing things about Granada for me is, is the value for money here. To say it's a very well visited city and it's a cosmopolitan city 
it's renowned to be really good value for money to live in, to visit. So I said the beer and wine's cheap, the food's cheap. You get a really decent meal for about 20 euros for two of you. So 10 euro mm. ahead. Um, our buses are really cheap. I'll talk about that in the transport. Getting around, all the things that you see, like going to the Alhambra. The Alhambra's only 14 euros mm. to get in. It's a World Heritage site. You know, you just, the, the museums are five euros for this, two euros for that. So it's a very, very accessible city. It's very accessible on foot as well. You can walk, you can traverse the city all around the main areas within an hour. Mm. So it's, apart from the Arbor theme and the Alhambra, it's all on the flat as well. So it's really, really good for walking. Mm. Uh, but there are, you know, there's, there's buses all around the city if, you, if you're not terribly mobile. Mm, we stayed in the Albertine and it, that was lovely because it, it is it's just all um, cobbled streets and lots of, yeah, it is a, a bit of a climb to get to the top, but it's well worth visiting the, is it St. Nicholas? St. Nicholas Mirador, yeah. Plaza, the Mirador, and that's just looking straight across at the Alhambra. And yeah, go there in the evening as it as the sun goes down and it lights up. It all goes pink. Gorgeous. Yeah. And there's all restaurants along the side, so you can be eating while you're doing that as well. The Albertine is fantastic. Be prepared to get lost because all the streets look the same. Hmm. Um, In fact, deliberately get lost, I would say. Deliberately do that. Yeah, I think it was years before we went the same way to San Nicolas Mirador twice. It would be, oh, not been down this road before. Hmm. Uh, There's one lesser known thing about Granada I think uh, I would like to share with everybody is uh, our very special street artist, El Nino del Pinturas. Mm-hmm. So Granada was one of the first cities in Europe that allowed graffiti. So in the 80s, uh, the street art movement that had come over from America in the 70s uh, came into Europe and all the other European cities were busy whitewashing everyone graffiti and busy whitewashing. But typical Spain and Granada, the mayor at the time went, no, I'll tell you what, you carry on. And let's see what you've got. Let's have a look at it. Mm-hmm. So for about 10 years, he allowed it to be legal. And some of the artwork that we've got is phenomenal. It's not graffiti, it is street art. Mm. And one of the artists, El Nino, was uh, was a street artist at the time. He then went on to become a professore in the University of Modena. And so the city have adopted him as some kind of uh, real son of the city. If you mention Banksy to anyone here, they're like, Banksy's Banksy. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's El Nino. So his artwork you can see all over the city and he has a very distinctive style. He has a cog in it. So whenever you see it behind whatever he does, you'll see this cog and that's how you can identify his work. A lot of his work is about peace, love, harmony, embracing each other. And he'll just do one overnight, it, absolutely. And I'll just pop up somewhere and he's like, oh, there's a new El Nino. He just did one two weeks, three weeks ago, he did a, an artwork on canvas and he, he raffled it for a fiver. You could oh. buy a ticket for a fiver and win his original work. We didn't win. Uh, but we went along to see him finish it and he was unusually out in the open painting. So it was really cool to see mm. him in the flesh. But I would recommend if you come to Granada to go on a street art tour and look at street art through different eyes and see it as art, not as graffiti. Uh, it, it's a wonderful way to see the city uh, and walk all around and learn about how people have expressed themselves here. And of course, then it's here to stay. And you see, there's one that we've got in our village in Fennis, which is, uh, we're about three kilometers outside of Granada. And I, I'd never seen it before. We were just walking the other day and I took a photo and I sent it to El Nino because I follow him on Instagram and I tagged him in it and I was like, oh, I've just seen him. He goes, oh, I'd forgotten I've done that. I did that years ago. So <laughs> it's a really good, fun, fun way to see the city. So we're, we're very, very, very proud of him. So yes. That's Granada. That's the city. Uh, there's actually loads more to say about that, but we could fill a whole show about Granada City. Yeah. But let's move on to the next one, number seven, transport. Transport here may just it just transforms the way you live we do have a car we have passed our spanish driving test which we're both very yeah, proud yeah. of uh, but you know most of the time we take public transport it is phenomenal so we live on the end of one bus route our village is the is the terminus and the other end of it is at the bus station actually in granada it's 50 minutes end to end 
it transfers from the east through the south side and up to the north side of the city. And I think there's 30 stops. Guess how much it is to go on the bus? I'm guessing it's going to be really cheap, like uh, 250 something like that. Is it that cheap? 44 centimos. <laughs> and I thought I was going cheap. <laughs> 44 centimos to go from one end to the other. And any Amazing. stop in between. Just, you just pay 44 centimos, get on, you can get on one stop or 30 stops. And our bus goes through all the touristy areas right through the city centre. You've got that. You've got the metro system. <clears throat> the metro system kind of goes from west to sort of northeast. And that's fairly new. That only opened in 2018. Same price. Mm. Get on that. And we've well, actually we've done that end to end just to say we have. That's mm. more. I'd say it's more sort of business areas, but it's still a great transport link. Then we've mm -hmm. got the A7, which is mm -hmm. just down the road from us, which is the longest uh, dual carriageway in Spain. It goes from. <clears throat> Algeciras right up to the French border. So once we mm. drop down on our 46 down to the A7, which is the road that takes you down to the coast, which is takes about 35 minutes to get onto that road, we can transverse the entire south, southern section of Spain. And it's mm -hmm. all toll free now. There's not a single toll on it anymore. We've made it toll free. So to That's be amazing. In Granada, we've got our own airport. We've got Federico Garcia Lorca Airport, which is pre-pandemic was quite international. It's mostly national now, but they're just opening up in March back to Gatwick. Mm -hmm. So you can fly from Gatwick directly into Granada on Vueling. We've got Malaga Airport, which is now an hour 40 away. So mm. from here, we're super connected to mm. many, many places in Spain. Especially um, to Malaga, actually, because you don't have to go down to the coast and along to Malaga, there's a there's another road that goes, it curves down, so that's actually a shorter route. To Malaga Airport from here, it's an, an hour and 40 oh. through Arxakir. It's about, we're about 40 minutes to Locker, so from here. But a dead easy road all the way, mo motorway, mm. dual carriageway all the way. So it's, uh, yeah. I think, for a city that's quite small itself and contained, to come and live here, well, visit, but to live here, we're so well connected to everywhere else. It's, it mm -hmm. makes it really easy. So, yeah, that's really important to us. Mm -hmm. Now, we chose Malaga province because we wanted to be closer to Malaga Airport because at the time, that's where all of family and friends could fly into a lot easier from various different parts of the UK. It's definitely a much bigger airport than, than Granada was at the time, certainly. <clears throat> Yeah, I think Malaga will always be the, the predominant one. And also now, of course, they're opening up links from Malaga to America, mm -hmm. direct flights as well. So I think Malaga mm. will always be the premier one. Uh, but it's so for us, if we wanted to fly to Barcelona, for example, it's 50 minutes on a plane. And I think it's, I don't know, it's about mm -hmm. 60 quid or 70 quid, something like that. Any other things about transport we need to say? Um, no, I think that's it. It's yeah. just really easy to get to. And once you're here, like I said, mm. to, to get around the city, uh, if you're not mobile, it's a, unlike other perhaps European cities where you've got to do a lot of walking. You don't need to. Here there's there's buses that take you all around the city, little mini buses to get up the Albay scene, big buses to get you across the city. So, uh, mm -hmm. yes, enjoy the transport when you come. Excellent. So let's move on to the final one, number eight. We're going to talk about olives. Spoiler alert, I, I, I'm not a massive olive fan. I, I wouldn't <laughs> worry if I never had one again. But I'm very appreciative that they're so important to the region in which we live. I have never seen so many olive trees in all my life since we moved here. It is, mm. I can't describe, I'm looking out the window now, and we li literally look onto a mountain where we are, and even on that side of the mountain, there's an olive grove. They go on for miles and miles and miles, as far as the eye can see. Mm. I didn't know until we moved here that Spain was the biggest producer of olive oil in the world. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, how many how many tonnes of olive oil do you think we produce, Andrew? Oh, I, this, is, this is the question where it's going to be billions of tonnes, <laughs> millions of tonnes? 10 million, uh, 10 million, 10 million. Tons a year. And interestingly here, it's still really expensive. Mm -hmm. 
which I was a bit, I couldn't really understand why that was since we have so much of it, but it's because we keep the first pressing of the virgin olive oil here mm. and export the second and the third pressing, which are cheaper. So back in England, if you buy a bottle from Aldi and it's like, I don't know, pound 50 or pound 70, it's because it's the third or fourth pressing. Mm. Over here, you'll get the first pressing. Mm. So it's known here as liquid gold. And it's what many, many businesses in this region are, are built on. Many rich families are built on it. And when you taste it here, it's like drinking whiskey. I've never, mm. honestly, we have one. My next door neighbour, her mother lives in Hyen, which is not in Granada province, but it's only 96 kilometres away. So it's a day trip. And Hyen is very, very famous for its olive oil. Mm. She brought us some back from her mother's village. And I just couldn't believe it. It's just so smooth. It's fantastic. You can't stop dipping your bread in it. Mm. And you get them, I say with all your tapas, you get bowls and bowls and they're everywhere, all different shapes, sizes, stuffed with anything you can imagine, garlic, peppers, tuna, anchovies, great crates them everywhere. But it's what the area is built on. It's very, very important to our economy. So... If you like olives, this is the place to be. So you must come here and try them. So anything else we want to say about Granada before we round off? I genuinely think it's one of the best places in the world. And that's it, that's a bold statement. But I've just had my best friend over to stay. And we were at the Alhambra and she said, so this is my most favourite place in the world. And I defy anybody to come here without a smile on their face without their shoulders dropping and without feeling that a little bit of their life's been changed when they leave. That's excellent. I remember when we arrived, me and Les, we, we got to Granada and we found the big plaza, I don't know what it's called. Plaza the, Nueva. That's the one. And we went to one of the, the restaurants. It was baking hot. I think it was only June, but it was baking, baking hot. It was hotter than a normal June. And that's saying something in Granada because it just it's one of the hottest places. And we were sat in this restaurant and they had the water sprays on. And it just it just got me, just got me straight here. Um, <laughs> it's getting me now just thinking about it. And I said, I said to Liz, I think this is better than Paris. And that for me was was saying something because well, I'll tell that you city story means a lot. About Granada, we used to come here every year. For a couple of days to decompress we both john my husband and i had both had very high powered stressful jobs mm. and we'd come every year for a couple of days to decompress and then we go down to the coast mm -hmm. and that was our our summer and we came one year and it was in the november i think we came for a quick winter trip mm -hmm. and we went to our favorite bar which is called bar patio prazerito in mm -hmm. uh, just off san mateus in the rejo Lovely little Spanish bar owned by a family, off the, a little bit off the beaten track. And I said, right, come on, we need to go. I said, we're going to get up early tomorrow. I turn around, John's crying. I said, what's the matter? What's happened? And he's just sat there, just with tears dripping down his face, and he's clinging onto the edge of the bar. I said, what's happened? He said, I can't leave. I can't leave. He said, I have to live here. I said, right, okay, bold <laughs> statement. Uh, not necessary in our life plans, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, we'll talk about it. And I am not kidding you. This is no word of a lie. I had to peel his fingers off the bar. <laughs> I said, we've got to go. We've got a plane to catch tomorrow. And he said, like you've been said, this place has got to me. I have never been more myself than when I'm here. He said, wow. something happens to me when I'm here. And this is where I need to be. And that used to happen to me at the Alhambra. If I touched the walls and I would walk around it, I'd be overcome with this. Ooh, something's happened. When I went to the Capilla Real, which is the Royal Chapel where Isabella and Ferdinand are buried, it was the emotions you get when you think there's just something about this city. So mm. I get it, and here we are. That was 2018, 2021. We moved it, chucked the jobs in, chucked everything up in the air, and here we are. And we mm. will still go into Granada, like we did today, to go and get our second lot of TIE cards, yay, year two and three. And we're still like kids in a sweet shop. We're still walking around going, oh, look at that. Oh, you can see the mountains from that road. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that coffee shop. Oh, look at the cakes in there. Oh, <laughs> that. And that's 
that will never leave us. And I think as much as I miss living by the coast, because we used to live by the coast in England, this place is magical. And it, it gets to you, and it does. And I, I mm. hope that everybody who watches this and thinks, yeah, go on then, I'll have to give that a visit. Please get back in contact if you've been and tell us which when it got to you and how it made you feel because I defy anybody to leave here and it not have changed them. There you go. So there's the argument for Granada, everybody. Beat that. If you've got any more questions or comments, I've, I've not heard it said any better than that. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's, uh, it's, if anybody's got any more questions or comments, do put them in the YouTube comments below, as I said. And um, yeah, we'll answer you. And in a moment, I'll tell you what's on the show next week. But before that, let's say a massive, massive thank you to Ruth. Give her a big virtual hug for being so wonderful. And I'm sure we'll see you again very, very shortly. Thanks, so, Scott. You're very welcome. Bye bye for now. Well, wasn't that lovely? Don't forget to click on the like button and also subscribe if you haven't already done so. And uh, then you'll be the first to know what's coming up each week on the live shows and the midweek videos. Next Saturday, Chris from Upsticks is back and will be talking about renewing your non-lucrative visa and especially about the debate over whether you need one or two years worth of money in the bank. It's been a contentious issue on social media recently. So Chris has got clarification, official clarification on paper from the Spanish government officials in a few different regions, just to make sure it's not just one region that's interpreting the rules differently. So you'll be getting the information straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Don't miss it. Ask your questions in advance on our Facebook group and I'll see you next Saturday morning at our regular time of nine o'clock in the morning if you're in the UK or Ireland or the Canary Islands. That's 10 o'clock if you're in Spain or Central Europe. I can't wait. Don't forget, of course, you can get free yoga and meditation classes on the YouTube channel belonging to my lovely wife, Liz. That's called YouTube Yoga and Aromatherapy. The link is below with all of the other ones. That's all for this week. Someone pass around the free Granada tapas. Yum, yum. Peace and love and goodwill to all of you. Oh, one more cosmic little dance, shall we? Come on then, everybody. Bye for now. Here we go. Thank you.